This story took place in 2003 and is reminiscent of a thriller plot. The residents of the small town of Nome, located on the west coast of Alaska, were shocked when the naked body of a local resident, 19-year-old Sonia Ivanov, was discovered on the outskirts of town. Nome's population at the time was a little over 3,000, and all of these people knew each other by sight. The terrible discovery made the locals wonder how well they knew their neighbors, friends, and colleagues. After all, perhaps the killer was one of them. Sonia Dora Nichuk Ivanov was born April 13, 1984, in Unalakleet, Alaska. She was one of six children of her parents and belonged to an indigenous population, namely the Inupiat, one of the Eskimo people. After graduating high school with honors, Sonia set her sights on college. After spending her life in a place with a harsh climate, she dreamed of moving to Hawaii, but for that, she needed money, which she decided to earn on her own. In 2002, Sonia left her native Unalakleet, where about 600 people lived, and moved to Nome. There, she got a job as a secretary at the local hospital and began saving for her dream trip to Hawaii. In the fall of 2003, Sonia was supposed to go to Hawaii, but all of her plans were ruined weeks before she left. After moving to Nome, Sonia began to live in the same room with her friend Tamer. On the evening of August 10, 2003, they went out together to meet their other friends. Shortly after 1 a.m., Sonia went home, while her friend and roommate Tamer decided to hang out with her friends some more. Since the residents of Nome knew each other, neither Sonia nor her friends were worried when she walked home. However, Tamer, upon returning home, found that Sonia was not in her room. In the morning, she began calling her and Sonia's friends to find out where her friend was, but none of them knew where she might be. There are people who believe in the best to the end, and Timer was one of them. She did not report Sonia missing until August 12th at 5.16 p.m., about 40 hours after her disappearance. The police launched an investigation and examined Sonia's room, finding her valuables and some documents there, from which they concluded that the girl could not have simply left town. On August 13th, the search began, involving local police officers and volunteers. That same day, at 8.30 a.m., one of the search teams found Sonia's body near a gravel pit on the outskirts of the city. At the time, the local police office consisted of eight people, a chief and seven officers in different positions. What they all had in common was that they had no experience in investigating such crimes. Realizing this, the chief of police in Nome turned to the state police for help. A team of investigators and forensic specialists was to fly in from Anchorage. While waiting for her arrival, the local police were doing everything possible to keep the crime scene intact. The rain was coming, so they decided to cover the body with a tarp. A large number of photographs were taken beforehand in case the rain did destroy any possible evidence. On August 14th, officers from Anchorage arrived on the scene and immediately got to work. Sonia's body was naked. Except for the sock on her left foot, she was wearing nothing. No clothing or personal belongings of the girl could be found. During the initial examination, the forensic scientist found an entry wound from a bullet on the back of the head, which was hidden under the hair. After finishing work at the scene, the body was sent for an autopsy. During the forensic examination, it was determined that the cause of the girl's death was a bullet wound to the back of the head. Despite the fact that the body was naked, there were no signs that Sonia had had sexual intercourse before her death, nor did she have any defensive wounds. Given that the bullet removed from her head was fired at close range, her death looked more like an execution. While officers from Anchorage examined the evidence they received, local police interviewed Sonia's friends and colleagues, trying to figure out who might have wanted to harm her. However, this ultimately yielded no results, since the girl had no conflicts with anyone and could find common ground with everyone. The more time passed, the greater the tension among the townspeople grew, for the perpetrator could very likely be a well-known person who continued to remain at large. Six weeks after Sonia's death, on September 23, 2003, a patrol car with the tail number 321 was stolen from the local police parking lot. Officer Byron Redburn, to whom she was assigned, 
drove his personal car around the city and surrounding area in search of a stolen patrol car. He did this at night, assuming that if a patrol car was stolen by teenagers for entertainment purposes, they would probably turn on the flashing lights and be visible from a distance. Officer Redburn's personal car had a walkie-talkie tuned to a police frequency. Around 3.30 a.m., he heard his colleague, Officer Owens, who was on duty that night, ask for backup. Owens reported that he had found a stolen car near one of the mines, and when he attempted to approach it, he was fired upon. Redburn immediately rushed to the rescue, and when he arrived he found Owens. He was frightened, but luckily uninjured. The shooter managed to escape by abandoning a stolen police car with the tail number 321. A few minutes later other police officers arrived and the scene was cordoned off. At dawn, a helicopter took to the air to try to find the man who stole the car and shot at a policeman. However, the search was unsuccessful. The intruder managed to get away. Of particular interest was the car with the tail number 321. The window on the driver's side was smashed, and that was how the hijacker apparently got in. But it was not so much this that was important as the envelope lying on the passenger seat. Inside it was Sonia's work pass with her name and picture and a threatening letter. Among other things, it read, Pigs, I hate cops, I hate every one of you. Sonia was just a person in the wrong place at the wrong time. Every one of you should be more careful. I watch every move you make. You leave me alone, and I will leave you alone. I will also shoot you in the head if you get close. The author of the letter was unequivocally letting the police know that they had better stop investigating. Sonia Skip directly indicated that the person who left it was involved in her death. There were no fingerprints, no DNA, and no other evidence on the envelope. What had happened only reinforced the belief that someone in the community, whom everyone must know, was playing a double game. In such situations, people begin to lose confidence and become suspicious even of those closest to them. A threatening letter was found in a stolen police car on September 24, 2003. Before we continue, we need to go back to the night Sonia went home alone. Around 2.30 a.m. on August 11, 2003, two local residents, Florence Habros and her sister Danet, were sitting on the porch of their mother's house when they saw someone walk past them on the sidewalk. That person turned out to be Sonia. Danet was a senior in high school and knew Sonia because they both participated in a city league basketball game. Sonia walked past the sisters five yards away. They greeted each other, and Sonia walked on. A little farther away, a block away, a car stopped next to Sonia. It was an appropriately marked police squad car. The sisters watched as Sonia leaned into the car as the passenger side window slid down. After a few moments, she opened the door and sat inside, after which no one else saw her alive. On August 14th, City officials officially confirmed that the body found near the quarry belonged to Sonia Ivanov. Florence, 32, knew she had to report to the police that she and her sister had seen Sonia get into a police car that night. However, she feared that if she called the station, she would be talking to the same man who had driven the police car that night, and then she and her sister might suffer the same fate as Sonia. However, Realizing that the perpetrator might escape punishment if she did not report what had happened, Florence called the police and told them everything. For the next three weeks, she was in a state of anxiety as no developments occurred. No one contacted or interviewed her, which only increased her distrust of the police. It was not until three weeks later that one of the investigators who flew in from Anchorage, studying the case file, discovered information about Florence's call. He immediately went to her home to take her statement. Why the woman had not been interviewed earlier was unclear. It was put down to a backlog of work and a mix-up with phone calls. The new information radically changed the course of the investigation because now the traces led straight to the police station, where in addition to the chief, there were seven other people working. All local police officers were removed from the investigation into Sonia's death. It was necessary to find out which of the eight local police officers had picked up Sonia before her death. The suspects were narrowed to two after it was revealed that only two police officers, Officer Matthew Owens and Officer Stan Piscoya, were on duty the night of the girl's disappearance. Owens and Piscoya were questioned. Both officers denied having any contact with Sonia that night. 
To find out which of them was lying, the officers were asked to take a polygraph test. The test was scheduled for September 24th and was to take place in Anchorage. Owens and Piscoya agreed to take the test and were to travel to Anchorage by plane on September 24th. However, recall that on September 23rd, a police car was stolen and later discovered by Officer Owens, who he himself claimed was shot several times by the perpetrator with a gun. On September 24th, Stan Piscoya boarded a plane and flew to Anchorage, where he passed a polygraph test without a problem. Officer Matthew Owens needed a day to recover from the night shooting, and accordingly, he did not fly to Anchorage. This made Matthew Owens the prime suspect, and the investigators focused on him. A new polygraph test was scheduled for September 28th, and Owens failed. When asked to reconstruct the timeline of the events of the night he was on duty, and when Sonia went missing, Owens began to give conflicting testimony. Interviews with witnesses showed that no one in town saw him between 0.53 and 2.50 a.m. An investigative experiment was conducted to recreate the events of the night of September 24th, when Owens found the stolen car and was allegedly shot at. However, Matthew again gave contradictory testimony and was confused about the details, leading investigators to conclude that the entire incident was staged. On September 23rd, while on duty and knowing he was about to take a polygraph test, which he was sure to fail, Owens, with access to the keys to the cars in the parking lot, stole a squad car assigned to another officer. He organized this performance in order to divert suspicion from himself and not show up for a test for a good reason. The police profilers, after analyzing the letter found in the stolen car, concluded that it was very likely that the person who wrote it deliberately called the police officers pigs to make everyone think he was not one of them. Only two people, Stan Piscoya and Matthew Owens, would want to deflect suspicion from themselves. However, since Officer Piscoya had gone to Anchorage to take a polygraph test, which he passed without difficulty, there was only one person left who wanted to deflect suspicion, Matthew Owens. When Sonia's body was found, Matthew had the day off, but nevertheless he showed up at the crime scene, even though he had no way of knowing about it. Information about the discovery was not transmitted through police communication channels due to the fear that it would spread through the city ahead of time. As the investigation turned out, none of the co-workers or those who found the body reported it to Owens, and yet somehow he showed up at the scene. After talking to his ex-wife, detectives learned another important detail. The woman recalled that on August 12th, Matthew had called her and asked her to pick up their four-year-old son, who was visiting him that day, early. This happened at 4.30 p.m., and Matthew explained that he needed to get to work early because a girl was missing in town. It is important to note that this conversation took place before Sonia's friend reported her missing. Owens claimed that his wife got the date of the conversation wrong about Sonia, but this seems unlikely given that she remembers that it was his birthday. On October 25th, 2003, Matthew Owens, 28, was arrested. Shortly thereafter, he was fired from the police force and charged in the Sonia Ivanov case and tampering with physical evidence in connection with a staged theft of a squad car. He continued to insist on his innocence. After it became known about his arrest, several women contacted the police and told them that Owens used his official position and, while on duty, forced them into intimate relationships. He threatened them with violence and told them not to even think about going to the police because the police station would believe him and not some native woman. All of the women who suffered from the actions of the police officer had two things in common. First, they were indigenous, and second, they were intoxicated at the time of the incident. As a result of the official investigation, it became known that the local police office had repeatedly ignored the reports of violence. Subsequently, two women aggrieved by the actions of Matthew Owens and by the inaction of the police office in general sued the city of Nome. Both cases were settled out of court. All of the above led investigators to speculate that on the night of Sonia's disappearance, Owens was acting in a familiar pattern. Perhaps he offered the girl a ride home, and that's why she got into the car. But it is possible that he pointed a gun at her, forcing to get inside. However, 
Unlike the previous victims, Sonia was not drunk. Knowing how things ended up for her, one could conclude that she refused to submit to Owens and satisfy his needs. He was afraid that the girl might report him, so he decided to get rid of her. Being familiar with crime investigation, Owens forced Sonia to undress because his DNA might have been left on her clothes. This is only the authorities' version. Owens himself never made any confession. Detectives learned during the investigation that he was seen at a hunting camp a few days after Sonia's death, where he was burning some items. Court documents show that police searched the pit used for the fire and found evidence there, such as eyelets from jeans and shoes matching the brands of clothes and shoes that Sonia was wearing the night she disappeared. Also found at the scene of the search was a key that resembled the key to the house where Sonia had lived, but because of the severe deformation from the fire, experts could not definitively determine that it was the same key. During the investigation, Owens told the Nome police chief that he did not know Sonia, but at least seven witnesses were found who said otherwise. The murder weapon was never found. Naturally, the police officer did not use the service pistol to commit the crime. Also, according to court documents, the threatening note to the police was printed on a printer, which Owens had access to. On December 6, 2005, a jury unanimously found Matthew Owens guilty of the murder of Sonia Ivanov and sentenced him to 99 years in prison. In addition, he was added two more years for tampering with physical evidence. After 34 years, he will be eligible to apply for parole. In 2007, the Alaska legislature signed the Sonia Ivanov Act, which provides for a maximum penalty of 99 years in prison for police officers who commit first-degree murder in the line of duty. Owens appealed repeatedly, but all his attempts to appeal the sentence were unsuccessful. 